Minister, friends, welcome to this NABA Norfund seminar on bringing back jobs. With the COVID-19 crisis, African countries are facing a humanitarian crisis, but there is also an urgent need for an economic emergency relief. It's impossible to gauge the effects with certainty, but we have some estimates. These estimates show that the number of extremely poor will increase by at least 80 million in the world, potentially by 400 million in the worst case scenario. The failure to protect jobs will have major ramifications. So what can be done? How can we secure and bring back jobs? That's what we'll be exploring today. How is COVID-19 impacting African economies? What role can African banks play? And how can we bring back jobs? What solutions are we already seeing on the ground? What solutions do we need to create going forward? And what steps are needed? My name is Ilva Lindberg. I'm the EVP of Strategy and Communication here at Norfund, and I'll be your conversation guide for today. It's with great pleasure and some awe that I'm introducing our first speaker, Martin Wolf, who is the Chief Economics Commentator of the Financial Times. And for those passionate about understanding the global economy, I'll have to say that Martin is a bit of a rock star. He'll give us a perspective on how COVID-19 is impacting the African economies. So Martin, please, the word is yours. So thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and honor to be with you. I've been given 10 minutes to describe a huge and complex continent. So I will do my best. Um, and obviously it will be very superficial uh, unavoidably, but you can fill that in later in the day. Well, if you look at the latest um, global economic prospects from the World Bank, which were out a couple of weeks ago, they, uh, the forecast is that growth will be negative 2.8% for Sub-Saharan Africa this year and 3.1% positive in 2021. But most people, including the World Bank itself, recognize the risks are overwhelmingly on the downside. And given the rapid growth of the population of Sub-Saharan Africa, of course, this means very large declines in real incomes per, e per head across the continent, and uh, a very considerable likelihood that real GDP per head will not get back to where it was last year for several years, and a possibility that some part of the growth will never be recovered. And as a result, as has just been mentioned, a very large number of people are likely to be pushed into extreme poverty across the continent. Um, if the uh, World Bank's optimist fi optimistic figure of 80 million increase in absolute poverty is correct, it is very likely, it would seem to me, that well over half of that will be in sub-Saharan Africa. There are particularly hard hit countries um, here. Uh, if you look at the two largest economies, Nigeria down 3.2% this year, and South Africa um, uh, down a horrible 7.1% this year. So the likelihood is that they're gonna lose several years of growth and it is possible that it will be substantially more than that. It's a huge uh, blow and with huge risk. So that's the economic prospects. Let me just look at the sources of vulnerability of sub-Saharan Africa. Well, it's a very externally exposed continent. Um, many of the uh, sub-Saharan African countries, by no means all, are commodity exporters and very dependent on single commodities. Uh, and commodity prices have, of course, collapsed to a greater or lesser extent in the COVID-19 crisis. Um, some are involved in supply chains, which will affect them significantly. Um, there have been, third, huge disruptions on the capital account uh, uh, and the availability of foreign capital, particularly foreign private capital, which has been significant for middle-income countries in uh, the region. Um, yields on public sector debt have exploded upwards and significant debt distress in the public and private sectors are, as I think, a certainty. Um, many sub-Saharan African countries depend on remittances uh, from um, 
people who have migrated. And these, of course, have been massively disruptive because many of the people who were sending the remittances themselves are no longer receiving the incomes they're used to. And tourism is also a very important sector for a lot of the continent. And of course, with the disruption of travel, tourism is also seriously uh, disrupted. So the external environment is, uh, which is quite crucial for many, well, really all these countries, is uh, very adverse and there's nothing they can do about this. And then, of course, there are the internal problems. So far, at least on the statistics, the disease has not affected them dramatically directly. The number of deaths reported is relatively modest, uh, but it is rising and we don't know how bad it will get. It is important um, to remember that Sub-Saharan Africa has one health advantage, which is the population is very young. So it is, uh, if it is true that in this continent too, the elderly will be mainly affected, that's an important benefit from a demographic point of view. But otherwise, everything is very tr problematic. Lockdowns are particularly difficult to operate effectively uh, in economies where so many people work in the informal sector well over half. Uh, they depend on daily incomes. They can't stay at home. People live in cramped circumstances. Water, essential for cleaning, is often unavailable. Um, it's really hard to do the sort of things that we would take for granted in the West um, to, to handle this. There's a lack of health capacity. Health spending is very low uh, in most countries. Huge needs now. There's, as I've already mentioned, at the external side, there's a lack of fiscal capacity. The ability of countries to expand their public spending, expand their deficits easily in this context is very, very limited. And the, even before the, con the crisis, the World Bank's Global Economic Prospects Report stresses the scale of food insecurity. In fact, uh, they estimate that 129 million people, let's say 130 million people in 35 countries, were already in severe food insecurity. The most affected countries, therefore, and I can't list them all, tend to have weak health systems, large tourism sectors, severe balance sheet vulnerabilities, and high dependence on commodities. And if you add these things together, there are quite a few countries in this situation. Not all, but quite a few countries in this situation. So finally, uh, the future, how will Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa come through this? Well, it depends, I think, on uh, three things, uh, four things. First, what was going to happen to the world? How quickly the world as a whole will recover? Uh, we're trying to get back to normal in Europe, the United States, and of course, these Asians, Chinese have done relatively well. Are we going to see a pretty strong and positive recovery in the world economy or a faltering and weak one? And we don't know, we can hope, but we really don't know. And that will be very, very important uh, for sub-Saharan African countries for the reasons that I've already stressed. The second thing, of course, is how the domestic uh, political and institutional and economic structure manages this huge crisis. Uh, effective, uh, the quality of governance varies, of course, across the continent. The ability of the political and bureaucratic systems to respond to the crisis varies. Um, the trust in governments varies. And one of the things we've learned very clearly in this crisis is how important trust in government is. Uh, uh, so obvious, for example, in Vietnam, which has been so successful. And the final thing that will determine how they come out of this, um, the domestic side is, I think, and the external economic side is crucial, is how much help they're given. Uh, help uh, will be very badly needed. In my own view, it's so far been inadequate. There's been a debt relief or talk of debt relief for the, the low income countries, but there's clearly going to have to be more than that in dealing with private sector debt, um, uh, uh, corporate debt, and there was going to have to be a very major assistance to get the continent through so that it doesn't become the beginning of many lost years of development when much of sub-Saharan Africa was looking really quite positive. So those are my 10 minutes and I hope I've given you a reasonable overview of what is happening. 
Uh, I have to say in my conclusion that my impression is that some of the governments in sub-Saharan Africa have actually coped with this remarkably well, but the challenge is enormous and it must not be forgotten. That's wonderful. Martin, thank you so much for, for that very uh, helpful and insightful intervention. Um, if I may just pick up on, on a couple of things. Uh, one is, the, is where you, you ended. So, you know, how much help uh, are we now seeing and the fact that what we're seeing today is, is inadequate. And I think the responses to the crisis so far, they've focused mainly on immediate to medium term needs. So supporting cash trapped governments, uh, doing something with the social safety nets, uh, but to a limited extent, perhaps focusing on jobs and the potential impact that we're seeing or that we already are seeing on uh, significant unemployment. So could you expand a little on what further you think needs to happen, perhaps particularly with a view on the unemployment challenge? Well, I think that, um, and I don't claim serious expertise here, but the, since so much of the employment is generated in the informal sector, it's very hard to intervene in it directly. Um, so it will recover when the economies as a whole recover, which will depend on um, many of the things we've already talked about recovering. So I feel that in the short to medium run, um, the crucial thing is that governments have the resources to, um, to provide the necessary support for people during the period of partial or total lockdowns, partial lockdowns in fact, um, so that people can survive, food is available, they can feed themselves and their families while the disruption occurs. Um, if they, they're going to have these resources, it's really ineluctable that a large part of this money will have to go through governments, and therefore it depends to some degree on the effectiveness of governments. But I think it's clear that uh, uh, we're going to have to, to, there's going to have to be from external sources more funding than is currently available to keep so that the safety nets that are needed will be provided. Now, once the world economy recovers, then it's going to be very important that resources are available to um, um, ensure that investment continues, infrastructure investment continues, that uh, um, essential programs uh, for support of the population are maintained, not, not, uh, uh, not worsened, and that the international economic links, which, have been, which are so essential for African economies, are maintained and opened. Um, so one of the things I'm concerned about on the job side is a really big retreat from globalization, international economic integration on the behalf of, behalf of the developed world, because I think many African countries are going to be very dependent on the recovery of world trade, world commerce, and, uh, and of course, uh, lending to and equity investment in African business will again become essential. But the, to me, the priority now is to get through the crisis and then develop really well with minimal damage and then develop as a strong possible uh, return to growth and improved growth in these economies linking up once again with the world. So we must <laughs> lose what we have achieved to some degree, at least, in the pre-crisis past. And it, uh, you talked about the external environment and how crucial that is for, for what is now happening, both the withdrawal of foreign investment, uh, the loss of remittances, and uh, the falling commodity prices and so on. And we've seen this before, right, in the financial crisis, where capital flows are going out of Africa rather than into Africa and yeah. from a very low level. Yep. So again, we're seeing capital outflows when really we need capital inflows the most. Uh, do you have any, any thoughts on what might be done to, to change that and uh, what players in our part of the world can do to change it? Well, um, I think this is, first, I think the, the likelihood is, though it's not certain that this crisis will be worse for Africa than the financial crisis. And one of the important reasons for that is that the last financial crisis, there was a big offset economically, which was the huge boom in China. 
and we're not going to have a comparable boom from China. It's returning to growth, uh, but we're not going to have a comparable boom. So I think it's going to be a worse crisis. And, uh, uh, and that's the overwhelming evidence that I'm seeing. Um, so they, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, particularly um, severe. I think the, um, um, it's going to be um, really hard to reverse the capital flows. There are basically two things that could be done, um, both of which I think are interesting. One is I think official flows have to increase substantially. And I've argued in other pieces, for, uh, for example, for uh, the creation of, it's just one avenue, a huge new SDR creation, creation of special drawing rights in the IMF, with the developed countries that don't need them transferring their SDRs into a special fund, uh, probably within the IMF, a trust fund in the IMF for grants to, or very, very cheap loans. This could be a trillion uh, uh, dollars or so. It could be an enormous increase in resources. But I think when the private sector is fleeing, the public sector has to go in. And the other thing I've been thinking about, look, this is an exceptional crisis. Um, uh, um, this is a time when uh, the public sector should be considering providing perhaps temporary guarantees to private capital flows, taking some of the risk. Because obviously, quite reasonably, the pri private sector looks at where things are now and says, this is really, really risky. And a lot of that is a risk that nobody can insure against except the public sector. So the public sector should intervene uh, directly by directly fun funding or indirectly funding through guarantees on an exceptional basis to get through the crisis. Um, uh, we've seen in the developed world that governments have come in in a massive way to ensure the vulnerable, ensure their economies against the crisis. And I've argued from consistently from the beginning, we should take exactly the same view vis-a-vis -vis the developing countries. And sub-Saharan Africa is probably is the biggest and most vulnerable uh, um, um, assembly, as it were, of people in who really need the help. And this, none of this is their doing. This is very clearly an external shock of the first order, and uh, they need to be insured against the consequences in the ways I'm suggesting. Martin, uh, many thanks for uh, both your talk and then also for, for answering those questions and, uh, and being so clear in your message. That's much appreciated. Uh, we will now move on to looking more specifically at the role of banks in bringing back the private sector. But before we do so, uh, let's have a look at this report from the front lines. Strains we've had in over 50 years. The impact was already building up on horticulture and floriculture. COVID-19 just blew the whole situation up. One in three jobs in Africa are at risk due to the COVID-19 crisis. Lockdowns mean people can't go to work or transport goods. In the Kenya flower industry alone, around 150,000 people employed, mainly women, face the prospect of losing their jobs and income. Small businesses and the informal sector keep Africa going, but companies that go bankrupt during the crisis cannot give jobs to people afterwards. In Africa as a continent, the COVID-19 crisis has the potential to push millions of people into extreme poverty. We've tried to secure and keep what we could going. Our biggest problem was with flights stopping, we were not able to access all our markets globally. As of now, the impact has been quite bad on us because we only have two customers left out of 15. We only have carried on supplying the UK and Dubai. Companies in most sectors are affected, but the agriculture, agribusiness, tourist and flower sectors are especially hard hit. An emergency liquidity facility could be a lifeline to banks and their clients hit by the coronavirus pandemic, and DFIs can play an essential role in preventing the total loss of two decades of development work. How are we going to come back to what we used to do? If we are now able to borrow money at a, a good rate, 
we'll be very quickly be able to expand our, our frozen offer and get out to more of the world by sea. So we create more market, we process more product, and we work with more contract and outgrowers. Additional capital loans or guarantees are needed at a time when many foreign investors are pulling out of Africa. 100 billion US dollars is critical for an emergency economic stimulus to African companies, according to the UNECA. With this, we can hopefully prevent that millions more people are pushed to live below the poverty line. So a report from the field, a little bit choppy, I think, and, uh, but maybe that's a symbol of the realities on the ground. Things are definitely not going smoothly in this part of the world in the wake of the COVID crisis. It's now my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. Um, he is the CEO of DFCU Bank in Uganda, a bank that offers financial solutions tailored to meet the needs of small and medium-sized enterprises. And the SME segment is about 90% of DCFU's total loan book. So please, Matthias Kautamba, CEO of DFCU Bank in Uganda, the word is yours. Uh, thank, thank you very much. <clears throat> I will just try to make the most of the five minutes uh, to cover this all important uh, subject. I'd like to thank the previous speakers for a good detailed background uh, into the situation as it is. I think Martin has really laid it out really, really well and given a good background. I think from a, for a Uganda point of view, what we've seen is that every aspect of the SMEs has been affected. The areas where the majority of the people are involved uh, are what have been affected the most. Trade, tourism, hospitality, education, and everything else that is connected to the value chains of agriculture export uh, because of what's been happening. So some of the things that have happened as a consequence is that uh, there's been capital erosion and business failures for a number of these uh, uh, entities as their workplaces have been closed uh, for a relatively uh, long time. Uh, those fall in aggregate demand has impacted sales and overall profitability. This fall is largely as a result of, uh, you know, the lower remittances, exact, et cetera, and the absence of cash in households because many households have been locked down and people have not been working. There's an increased challenge of access to capital uh, as costs have gone up uh, in, in many ways where people have been accessing capital, family, friends, uh, Roscars, etc. And you know, supplier terms have become much more stringent. Now credit terms have been removed and all older, older periods uh, uh, are longer. So the need for cash now is much more important for suppliers of many of these SMEs. And for those that depend on any global supply chain, of course, have been heavily, heavily affected. For the expo exporters, uh, it's even worse. For the you, as you've seen, for fresh produce and even other aspects like coffee, tea, etc. So it's really, really, really far wide-reaching. All aspects of the uh, uh, you know uh, value chain of SMEs. So I mean, what are we doing? If you just look at what banks are doing at the moment, just picking the example a case for DFCU, what we've done is to ease cash flows for businesses. Uh, by restructuring facilities and giving up to 12 months in some cases so that these entities don't have to be making repayments in this period. Uh, we're also extending the tenors for a number of these facilities and where possible, as much as possible, reducing the installment when they begin uh, to pay. So we continue to support clients uh, with working capital facilities to sustain their businesses, especially those in supply of food, medical supplies, et cetera, and those key, key aspects that are important for the, for the country to run at this time. And through our trade finance solutions, we continue to support customers who want to import or export uh, by providing documentary letters or credit or guarantees as comfort to suppliers because that comfort is very low at the moment. We also act as a bridge between Ugandan SMEs uh, and who export and their buyers uh, to collect payments. And through technology, one of the things we've done is reduce the cost of our various payment options and technology uh, options to make it possible for people during the periods where they can't move too much uh, to be able to have a, a semblance of continuity uh, in the work of their small businesses. So, but there are several barriers uh, to, for us as banks to providing, you know, support to these SMEs. Many of them are informal and lack the basic regulatory requirements. So the risk uh, is higher. So the availability of some sort of guarantees at a time like this uh, to support an increased appetite of banks to support these uh, entities would be very helpful. We've seen that uh, in a number of uh, other countries. That is not going to be uh, happening here. Uh, there's also most SMEs, you know, do not meet uh, 
requirements in a time like this because collateral is undervalued now because of uh, 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 the falling value of properties at this time, et cetera. And the cost of lending to SMEs is significantly higher because of the administration risk and that sort of thing. So availability of uh, uh, well-priced uh, funding at this time to price and uh, lend at a time of crisis is something that will be uh, very, very, very helpful. <clears throat> so, I mean, so one begs the question, uh, if, if, we were, if there were a liquidity facility, what would it support, for instance? Uh, I think at this moment, uh, liquidity at the right cost will allow banks to increase financing to the sector. Uh, it will bring down the cost of lending and therefore uh, make it possible to absorb the other administrative costs associated with supporting uh, this crucial, crucial, uh, uh, you know, segment of, uh, of the business community in the country. And you know, long-term liquidity will also allow banks to support uh, longer-term finance, some of which is needed for recovery in a period like this. And, uh, and if that liquidity is available, you know, more SMEs will be supported and overall, the economic impact uh, will be higher. It's important to mention that in the case of Uganda, for instance, uh, you know, banks have really tried to front load the importance of liquidity and preserving liquidity uh, at this time. So the availability of additional liquidity will be able to, to free up uh, the, the, you know, the risk appetite to move uh, in a period like this to support the entities a lot much more uh, rather than hold back. Uh, without affecting key key ratios. I hope the five minutes uh, been used well. See, yes, many many thanks for uh, for sharing those experiences of what's happening on the ground. And uh, it's clear that um, you know all aspects of the SME value chain is being impacted. And then the question is, what are the banks currently doing, and what can the banks do going forward? And I think in in light of this, uh, I'd like to turn to the uh, Norfund CEO Telef Torlefson. Um, Matthias from DFCU, he spoke to the need for liquidity in order for banks to play this essential role of, of lending to SMEs in this time of crisis. Now, could you share some, some thoughts on what Norfund, what we in Norfund are doing in this respect? Thank you, Elvan. Thanks, Matthias. Uh, we, um, Norfund, we, we work on mainly two fronts in this crisis. One is to simply to be able to support the companies that we hold either directly or indirectly through funds. Uh, i.e. with new equity, with loans, and through proactive assistance and technical assistance to those companies to avoid too many layoffs uh, or that good, viable companies that used to be profitable are simply closed down because of the way the market is, such as Vertical Agro that you just uh, uh, heard about. Um, but on the financial sector, uh, we have about one third of our assets are deployed into banks or microfinance institutions and the likes and we work on two fronts there one is to provide systemic support to those banks and microfinance institutions or non-banks uh, as entities i.e to provide them with more equity or loans so that they can stay alive and also so that they can continue to operate the way they do um, and we are what we've seen is that for many of the banks, there hasn't been an instant crisis officially because what's been happening is that many banks, uh, they, uh, the governments have told people and companies they don't need to pay interest rates or interest or they don't need to pay uh, down on the loans. There's a sort of payment holiday. So right now it's looking relatively good, but that's being pushed out. So we need to make sure that they're able to, to face those times when the, when the non-performing loans really come up. And secondly, we're exploring schemes whereby we can help the banks to actually provide loans to particularly the SME sector. Many banks are not as proactive as Matthias in, in DFCU. Uh, they're more concerned about simply staying alive as a bank and in shrinking the balance sheet. So we are looking into schemes whereby we can help them to lend out to the SMEs, uh, either uh, with the risk sharing uh, we're doing together with some other commercial international banks and we're also looking together with EDFI. EDFI is a group of, of DFIs in Europe where we're looking at doing something together. Great, Telef, many thanks for that and thanks again to, to you Matthias also for being so proactive as a bank in this difficult situation uh, and Norfund has been uh, an investor in DFCU Bank since 2007, and we're still invested through our financial investments platform, Arise. 
So we're very happy to have such a long-standing partnership with you, Matthias. But maybe if I, if I may, Ilva, Matthias, maybe quickly you can tell the story how you've been uh, fed uh, from Norway and enabling you to become a bank boss, Matthias. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, so that's an interesting story. So I, I grew up in the time just after uh, the major wars uh, in the country. And I think at that time, the country was in the middle of a major uh, guerrilla insurgency in the early uh, 80s. So... Uh, you know, fresh fresh foods and proteins were, were really uh, a luxury. So I think at that time, Norwegian aid was a, a major source of nourishment. I was in boarding schools. I went to boarding school when I was six. So our diet was supplemented uh, by mackerel fish. Uh, so when I met uh, Tell of the first time, I, I reminded him that I grew up on Norwegian delicacy. Uh, what we, we, it was tinned fish, uh, which was served at, uh, at lunch, and we all... You would, you would look up to it. So uh, uh, partly I am the way I am uh, in a healthy shape as part of that early childhood nourishment, courtesy of the people of Norway. That's very good. It's good to hear that you, Matthias, are being fed on the, on the same things that my children are being fed on today. So uh, hopefully they'll grow up to be something like you, huh? So uh, we're now moving into the panel conversation. And as I said, what we'll be looking at here is the solutions that we're currently seeing working on the ground, but also solutions that are missing and then what needs to happen going forward. And I have quite the stellar panel with me today. Uh, we have Phyllis Wakiaga, who's the CEO of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. We have Stephen Karingi, the Director of the Regional Integration and Trade Division at the UN Economic Commission for Africa. We have Dag Inge Ulstein, who's the Minister of International Development of Norway. And I'd like to just, uh, Dag Inge, uh, congratulate you again on Norway securing a seat at the UN Security Council, which happened yesterday. And our final speaker in the panel, uh, Kari Helena Partipuli, who's the National Director of Plan International Norway. So Phyllis, I'd like to kick it off with you um, and to understand what kind of solutions we are currently seeing on the ground. Uh, we've heard a lot about the challenges, uh, you know, the situation that we're facing. It is a crisis. We're seeing increasing unemployment, more extreme poverty and so on. But let's now talk about the solutions that we're seeing happening on the ground. So uh, your members, uh, Kenyan manufacturing companies, especially SMEs, what kind of strategies are they imply, uh, applying on the ground and how do you see them working in practice? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I think I'd I appreciate the comments from the previous speakers that this has actually hit the manufacturing sector in Kenya quite hard. And you can imagine that the SMEs have been harder hit uh, because of the nature of their businesses. We carried out a survey uh, about a month ago with KPMG and the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. And some of the biggest uh, impacts were the issues around work, workforce reduction, the access to finance by SMEs and the subdued demand in the market. Um, however, uh, despite all these challenges, we are seeing a lot of innovation coming in from the manufacturing sector. I'm actually in a car because I'm going around visiting factories that have uh, repurposed their production towards the production of uh, PPE or protective gear for the healthcare uh, sector. Um, so some of the things that we are seeing uh, SMEs doing uh, include the issue of shifting their focus. Uh, about 78% of the SMEs from the survey we carried out have been able to shift their focus to focus on goods that are required currently. Uh, this, this include things like the PPEs, the hygiene products, and a lot of the products that are required uh, due to the crisis. Uh, the change in production lines has been uh, something that we've seen in about 10 out of the 14 sectors uh, within the manufacturing association. Uh, we've also seen them re just refocusing internally as, as businesses. Uh, there's been a big shift from increasing profitability, revenue, and, and, and growth in market. What we are seeing is a shift towards reduction of cost. Uh, they're also trying to see how they can retain jobs as much as possible so that we don't have a, a social crisis within the country. And a lot of businesses have also looked at how they can improve their cash flows, which which is critical to get through uh, this crisis. Uh, another thing we have seen is uh, that despite the crisis, uh, the local manufacturing sector has tried to ensure that they maintain the pricing of products 
And speaking to the competition authority in Kenya, they actually did indicate that they have actually seen products remain at the same price or in some cases even come lower uh, because we are seeing a lot of people uh, produce. Uh, I'd like to share a specific example. We have uh, an, a Kenya Fashion Council in, in, in Kenya, which uh, is a partner of the Association of Manufacturers that brings together a lot of local tailors. Uh, what they've been able to do during this season is to bring together their people and aggregate them, get their necessary approvals for production of reusable cloth masks. And they are now doing major supplies because in Kenya, everyone has to wear a cloth mask as long as they're in public. So these SMEs have come together and they are now able to aggregate and tender for, for, for bigger business. So that innovation, I think, is some of the things we are seeing that we think is quite positive uh, within, within the country. We've also seen another group innovate a ventilator um, and, uh, and, and it, it brought in a, a number of uh, SME and companies together and they were able to innovate and come up with a ventilator that has been tested by the local standards body and the healthcare bodies. Thank you. So, so Phyllis, does, does this mean that the picture might not, not be as gloomy as we think? Or are these more isolated examples that are, you know, basically keeping things going, but, but not enough? These are examples of, of how innovative and adaptive people have been uh, during this season. The reality is either way that there is subdued demand. There are still challenges of lack of liquidity in the market. Uh, we've seen uh, a number of businesses also still have to re release people. And uh, because of the lockdowns in, in, in the country, we are unable to move from Nairobi, which is the capital city, and also Mombasa, which is the second largest city in the country. Meaning that, of course, there will still be impacts. But what I think is clear is that people and businesses have tried to be very innovative uh, within the crisis. We've also seen, because at the end of the day, this is a health crisis, um, the, the, the government's coming in to try and mitigate and reduce uh, the spread the spread of the disease and uh, mm -hmm. that that has been uh, equally uh, contained but the impacts will be there uh, and 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 what we are trying to do as an association at least is work with our members to see how we can support them through we're also having conversations with government to look at issues around credit guarantee schemes for the sme sector the banks have also put moratoriums on payment of loans mm -hmm. given uh, three months moratorium, six months moratoriums. So all these uh, put together will mitigate. It will not do away with the impact completely, but mm -hmm. it could be the impact. But so re redu reducing some of the effects, but by no means yes. solving it. But still, never waste yes. a good crisis, right? That's um, true. So uh, I'd like to move on to to you, Stephen, as director uh, for regional integration and trade at the UNECA, uh, and to understand what governments are doing on the ground in Africa. So could you share some thoughts on, you know, what are the most effective steps that you've seen so far? And please be specific by giving examples in terms of what the African governments are doing to support SMEs in overcoming the COVID crisis. So thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good afternoon, Minister. So first of all, let me um, associate myself with uh, most of the comments that have been actually made by those who have spoken uh, before me. I do hear a lot of what it is that um, the Economic Commission for Africa and the African Union Commission have actually been doing. Now, but specifically to your question, what African governments uh, have done to support uh, SMEs, uh, let me break it into two. First, there is the general macroeconomic support that uh, African governments have actually been doing. And this have actually happened through monetary and fiscal policies, uh, specifically, 44 African countries have employed monetary policy easing tools, especially the policy rate cuts. Uh, we have 38 countries that have employed liquidity provision for banks and unbanked finance companies, such as the easing of collateral terms, like we have heard from uh, Felix. Uh, 46 countries have employed regulatory and supervisory support for banks, such as the lowering of reserve requirements and credit guarantees, another, another issue that has come up uh, from the previous uh, speakers. In some instances, we have actually been able to see within the continent uh, regional approaches to trying to deal with the, with the crisis. A good example here is uh, UMOA in West Africa, which has coordinated modalities on a variety of loan repayment relaxations. Other popular tools that we have observed include the reductions in various tax rates 
and also the state utility prices for industries are uh, being, being brought down. For some countries, they have had some very specific and targeted support to some of the hardest hit sectors. An uh, example here is Egypt, which has guaranteed loans for the tourism sector. It has also instituted a two-year grace period for loans to the aviation industry. Kenya has set aside $5 million specifically for the support to the tourism sector. So these examples are basically the usual macroeconomic tools. They do not support uh, uh, or target uh, SMEs directly, but try to support uh, the overall economy. Some countries, though, have instituted measures that are specifically targeting SMEs. Uh, where I stay here in Ethiopia, the Development Bank of Ethiopia has opened a special funding window for quick disbursements to SMEs and also extended extra credit to microfinance institutions that target SMEs. Uh, in South Africa, the South Africa's debt relief fund specifically targets SMEs that are in distress. And in Angola, Banco Millennium Atlantico has received about $40 million specifically for SMEs in agriculture and manufacturing. However, these specific measures that I have uh, highlighted are more difficult to design and to target, especially given that most uh, SMEs in the continent are in the informal sector. And I think this is the point that um, uh, Matthias was also making, where measures like tax relief and loan repayment permits are not easily uh, uh, applicable. So these are very specific examples of what is happening in terms of government support uh, to, the, to the economy and to the SMEs. But like I have indicated, um, there are fewer SME-specific measures, even though SMEs account for 90% of all businesses um, in, uh, in, in Africa. So that's the response to your first question. If you want me to, to talk about how the DFIs could help, and what I see to be the role of the banks, uh, I'm happy to do. I'm happy to do that. Great. Thank, thanks very much, Stephen. I think we'll get back to to the second question. But thank you for so crisply outlining both the macroeconomic uh, actions, the sector specific ones, and then targeting SMEs. Even though that is, of course, difficult, given that many of those are are in the informal sector. Uh, Karilena, I would like to to turn to you now. Um, and of course, it goes without saying that. You know, job creation is key for, for development and for poverty reduction. Without a job, you're likely to be poor. So, um, and Plan International is specifically working on youth unemployment. And could you share some thoughts on what kind of things do you see happening on the ground now, uh, targeting specifically the challenge of youth unemployment? Yes, thank you. I would just like to sort of start by saying that you know, the youth population has been especially hard hit during these times. And this goes across the globe, but I mean, also especially on the African continent. And, and uh, you see the big loss of, of education, which helps building skills. And, uh, and also the young people have a very weak connection to the job market. And also there was a huge deficit of jobs created for young people before COVID-19, so the situation now is, is dire. Um, what works? Um, I think a lot of the things that we did before COVID-19 still works, uh, but it's now perceived as much more risky, uh, but, uh, but we need to still keep doing them. And um, I think also maybe I would just like to say, because you said in the question that without the job you are poor, uh, but you can be poor with the job as well, especially some of the jobs that some of the young people hold. So we need jobs that pay a decent salary. And we need to continue also building skills uh, because this, this creates a skilled workforce that can create also new jobs for the future. So it's both a short-term solution, of course, uh, but it's, it's maybe more importantly, a long-term solution to have to create the meaningful jobs and have a skilled uh, workforce. I mean, Martin Wolf was referring to how this is going to take a long time to recover. So again, returning then to finally to, to what works on the ground. I mean, we are an INGO, so obviously we cannot 
create jobs uh, by ourselves. It's key to our uh, to to what we have to do, uh, but uh, but we need to do it in partnerships and and. Uh, just one sort of very concrete examples coming from, we've heard a little bit from Uganda already from, this is from Eastern Uganda, where we work with, um, Plan has the connection with rural youth um, that works in the agriculture sector. And you hear the ag sector has been especially hard hit. It was a vulnerable sector to begin with, creating very little substantial uh, value if you look at income. Um, and uh, and we work we have that connection with the informal sector with the youth we know how to organize youth and we've partnered up with Accenture that is good at you know the market analysis and also then a local actor KK Foods uh, KK Foods provided the access uh, for the smallholder producers to market and especially to international market now that's of course challenging now and this was this was the chilly uh, the Chile value chain. But again, luckily in this project, and I think this is key to understand, there was this uh, focus on skills training and, and giving skills to the local farmers and KK Foods was essential in doing that uh, with quality inputs, with, uh, with education, how to grow, how to diversify. So that, you know, a lot of those skills that they got, even though you had the loss of the international market specifically going into um, to uh, shops and supermarkets in the UK, uh, you can, you had, uh, you, you still know a lot about how you can farm uh, and actually make money from it. And in this project alone, sorry. So I think this is a this is a good example and an illustration of the fact that we need to make sure that we're creating jobs that are both decent and stable because we know that the COVID crisis, of course, it's not the first and it's not going to be the last crisis impacting poverty and unemployment on the African continent. So the importance of really building resilient and sustainable companies that create good jobs over time, how, how important that is. I, and I think on, on that note, uh, I'd like to bring it on, over to, to the minister, to you, Doug Inge. Um, you know, we've heard about the millions of jobs that are at risk, um, especially for women and youth, perhaps. And this is coming on the top of an already very challenging situation uh, where there are not enough jobs to the millions entering the labor market. So uh, you're, of course, in contact with many of your minister colleagues on the continent. Um, and I would like to hear from you um, you know, we've heard about some of the solutions, we've heard about some of the challenges, but what do you think is, is missing if we are going to succeed in bringing back the jobs that Africa needs? What are the missing actions or missing li links, would you say? Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for facilitating this uh, conversation. And it's been really interesting to, to hear uh, all the insights given uh, by the other participants. And, and again, it's, um, as we all know, I don't think that we have the full we know the full impact of the COVID-19 situation in Africa uh, now, but we know enough. Uh, and, and again, I think that as, as uh, Martin Wolf said uh, in, in the beginning here, I, I think it's, it's the same treatment that are needed in, in many of these countries that we actually are dealing with and working on, on here. So we have kind of different lane, lanes. Uh, in one side, um, uh, emergency economic stimulus, as uh, some mentioned, like uh, liquidity uh, facilities or added loans and guarantees. And, and as the Tala, uh, Tala also said, to, to make sure that these companies and, 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 uh, and we, we, we let these uh, companies and banks and financial institutions that are, um, are alive through this pandemic is, is one of the lines. But on the other side, from the Norwegian government side, we also think, and we see that here in Norway, that the importance of trust and to, to actually trust the health system uh, will also be an important part of actually uh, reopening schools that, that businesses uh, uh, run again. Um, so so I, I think there are kind of two, two important lines that we need to, to combine in this. Um, uh, so again, and what may be missing is, is a, a coordinated response. Uh, is that we can actually uh, uh, make sure that the efforts that we are, are, are taking are, are making the best effect. So, but there are some really interesting uh, paradox uh, that, that we are seeing these days because the lockdowns uh, had severe negative consequences. But, 
when we now see some of the, the numbers uh, are increasing um, and, and perhaps the pandemic is spreading, then you see some of the, uh, the measures are and, and, and the lockdowns are kind, kind of opening again. So I really think that we just need to follow the situation very closely uh, and, and to, to take action uh, when we also see how, how things are developed. But, but I think these two lines will be very important. Thank you very much, Tegging, and you're of course right. I mean, this is uh, the situation changes from day to day, and it's very unpredictable. Um, the only thing we can say for certain is that the the consequences are substantial, and that we need to act, as you're saying. Um, Stephen, in terms of, of what's missing, uh, I'd like to pick up on a point that you had, um, uh, saying you know some, something about what the DFIs, the development finance institutions, and the role that they can play in this space. Uh, could you share, shed a bit more light on that? No, uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Ilva. I think um, um, the intervention by Matthias and uh, also by the CEO, uh, that is uh, Telep, has actually given us some good uh, education. But uh, essentially what, um, what the private sector uh, in the continent needs is to uh, a counter-cyclical uh, action, as we call it, uh, uh, by the DFIs, uh, this is so that they can be able to support the, profit, the profitable, although illiquid, maybe businesses, and also ensure, for instance, for now, uh, agricultural inputs, and also trade continues so that uh, COVID-19 does not descend into a food security uh, crisis. Um, this strategy, as we have had, could include um, the restructuring and also the offering of additional liquidity it could also be towards the support of the two-year debt standstill for all of Africa, also supporting foreign exchange liquidity to reduce insolvency risks. Uh, I believe uh, that particular attention should be given to targeting those banks that have the outreach and experience in supporting SMEs. We have had the example of DFCU in uh, Uganda. Uh, we are familiar with KCB in Kenya Equity Bank, which operates in more than one market in Africa, GT Bank, Zenith Bank, Echo Bank, Access Bank in West Africa, or the First National Bank uh, in South Africa. Uh, the DFIs must also work with banks to ensure that uh, information about, uh, about available support is, uh, is, is, is known because 55% of uh, small businesses have reported that uh, they do not have enough information on the kind of assistance that they can actually receive during, during, during this time. Those are some of the examples of how the DFIs could actually come in. So, so there's a larger role for the DFIs to play. Uh, the financing needs to be there, it needs to be accessible, but also people need to know about it because otherwise it won't work either. Um, Phyllis, if I may play it back to you again. Um, what do you see as the immediate steps that should be taken in the short term, but with a view to secure jobs in the long term? Some of the immediate views that uh, things that need to be done in the short term include releasing liquidity into the market. Uh, this is a conversation we've been having with our government around the issues of delayed payments to suppliers because at the moment businesses do need the cash to be able to keep people in, in, in their jobs. We also have a proposal uh, out of the study we did on the establishment of an emergency rescue fund that can be supported by the development partners. And this would be done by identifying the vulnerable businesses uh, that require support and entrepreneurs. At the association, for example, we have an SME hub and we are able to map out the SMEs that are really, really struggling uh, because of this. And this emergency fund would go a long way in supporting them. Mm. This and this the sorry, this emergency fund, Phyllis, would that be for, for Kenya or would it be more widely? Um, it would be an emergency fund for business. It can operate in Africa. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was speaking specifically for, for Kenyan businesses, but it's a fund that could be set up by different governments mm -hmm. uh, to rescue their SME businesses that are hard hit by the crisis. Mm -hmm. The other right. proposal that could be immediate and that is happening is around the issue of widening the scope of social protection measures uh, through emergency response funds targeting the vulnerable people who've lost their jobs in certain sectors. And that's another area we can be deliberate about supporting um, individuals here. Yeah. Great, thank you. If I can, can return to, to you, Dougie, as we're wrapping up the panel here, 
uh, to end on a, on a positive note. So we talked a lot about the challenges, but we've also talked about the, uh, the solutions we're seeing out there. Uh, and I'd like to, to hear your thoughts on you know, what should make us hopeful? What makes you hopeful that we'll be able to bring back jobs? Thank you. You know, I'm, um, I'm an optimist by nature. So, so again, and I think we should never lose hope. And, uh, and we, we have the solutions and we see some of the countries that are dealing quite good with this uh, situation. And we have um, a lot to learn from each other here also. And we have many good examples uh, of that from the, this panel also. So, so again, I, we know that this is uh, temporary. It's, uh, it will pass, but we know the consequences will, will be kind of different from different regions and different countries and different markets. But, but I, I think we need to, to just be uh, persistent and, and maintain our long-term perspectives in, in, in this. Um, it, it's a temporary pause, if we could say uh, so. Um, but, so it's, it's not a fundamental end to international business relations and, and trade. So I think we just continue to, to, to share information and to learn from each other. And, and, uh, and again, we, we, we need action and we need solutions. And, and we got some of them uh, on the table uh, through this panel also. So, so again, um, uh, we should never lose hope. But of course, for the most marginalized ones, for, for the poor, uh, it's, it's uh, times like this, the crisis will hit them hardest. So we, we just need to stand firm and have more action. So we shouldn't lose hope, lose hope, but we need to use our hope to uh, do something about the current situation. Um, thank you so much to, to the panelists. I think what we'll do now is to give the word to Telef uh, and he will do a bit of a wrap up of uh, what we've heard so far. And uh, Telef, I have a couple of questions for you now at the very end. Uh, and I think the first question is, you know, what are we now missing in order to really bring back jobs in Africa? And specifically, what will we in Norfund do differently going forward in order to be part of the solutions to this? Thanks, first, in terms of what we're missing, I, I, I believe that it's hard to ask governments in this part of the world for more money right now because they're being stretched and there are massive demands locally. But we, we seem to be run the risk of missing the ability to reprioritize. Right now, we need more money for, for private sector. And, and that has to be prioritized because we're running the risk of undoing many of the development gains that have been hard won over the last decade. Uh, so that's one area. Second area is that it's limited what the DFIs like us and governments can do with public funding. Uh, we need private players to come along. And um, we need to team up with commercial banks, uh, such as KLP here in Norway or Standard Charter Banks and the others. But we're still missing the sort of the Black Rocks and the sovereign wealth funds of the world to come back and to actually invest. We're still seeing money taken out of the emerging markets, not coming in. And stock markets have come back up in this part of the world. And some wonder why, uh, what's the basis for the massive revaluation. But money hasn't come back to the, to the poor part of the world. And there should be interesting opportunities as well right now. I mean, invest during times of crisis. That's when, that's when you really can make uh, great gains as well. So those two elements I feel are missing. And in terms of Norfolk doing differently, uh, firstly, uh, we now need to act fast, be nimble and expedient. So we, we're aiming at being faster than what we normally are to get the money out into companies that really need it. And secondly, it is the, the particular focus on the financial sector that we're having. Um, I mean, the banking sector is perhaps the most important area where DFIs can intervene. They serve millions of people, they serve their SMEs, and that's where we can have the multiplier effect on our money. So I think those two are the most important elements. Thank you. And uh, it's very tempting to ask you the same question that I What makes you hopeful that we'll be able to bring back jobs? I mean, first, 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 of all, first of all, I'd like to say that I've been, I've been very impressed by most African countries' ability to mobilize and handle the virus. Uh, if you compare it to the UK, the US, or Brazil, or, or I mean, a number of other countries, I mean, it's very hard for them now to be patronizing because the many African countries have had governments that demonstrated a better ability to handle the crisis and the virus. And, and it also looks in Africa as if the disease as such, the virus is likely to be less damaging uh, in terms from the health perspective, also because of the young population, but the economic part of it is more important. 
And uh, uh, thirdly, uh, as was also said by Phillips, I, I've been impressed by many African entrepreneurs that we see in our portfolio that they better trained than us in Europe and in the US for that sake to handle a crisis. Uh, Africa has been having all kinds of crises. They, they're nimble, they act fast, they're creative. So many of the entrepreneurs are impressing me by the ability to, to get things moving and to be able to operate despite everything else going up against them. And lastly, I'd say that the, the, the massive macroeconomic challenge facing Africa seems to be well understood this time. Uh, we seem to be agreeing on the challenge. Uh, uh, at least that's a good starting point. Thanks. Hey, many thanks, uh, Telef, and many thanks also to the speakers for joining us, for being so uh, nimble and engaged on a digital platform. That's quite impressive. I'd also like to, to thank the audience. I think we had some 250 or 300 participants, not just from Norway, but also internationally. Uh, and finally, to the Norwegian audience, uh, make sure that you read the op-ed in uh, Dagens Næringsliv, the Norwegian leading daily business paper, uh, which is written today by, um, by Telef on this uh, particular topic. So I think this is not the end of a conversation, but it's the beginning of one. And what we can do now is not to talk so much about the challenges and the problems, because I think we know what they are, although that is changing fast. But now we need to get down to action. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.